Welcome to CIS 579 Technology of eBusiness. This is Chapter 3, Retailing in Electronic Commerce, Products and Services. The learning objectives for this chapter include describing electronic retailing, or sometimes referred to as e-tailing, and some of its characteristics. We'll also talk about the primary e-tailing business models and, and try to classify them and, and make it a little bit easier for you to be able to distinguish one model from the next. We'll describe how online travel and tourism services operate and their impact on the industry. We'll discuss the online employment market, including its participants, benefits, and limitations. We'll describe online real estate services. We'll discuss online stock trading services. Then we'll move on to discuss cyber banking and online personal finance. We'll talk about the on-demand delivery of groceries and similar perishable products and services related to them. We'll talk about the delivery of digital products and online entertainment. We'll discuss various online consumer aids, including comparison shopping aids. And then we'll finish up by discussing disintermediation and other B2C strategic issues. Electronic retailing or e-tailing is, is a term that you might hear periodically, and it's really not anything to be intimidated by. It's really nothing more than just simply uh, a retailer that's selling stuff over the internet. Um, so that, that's where they do their, their primary business, if not their, their entire business. Um, e-tailers are the people who are actually doing that, they're the retailers who sell over the internet. As far as the size and the growth of the, the B2C market, it's really kind of hard to, to say, and the reason is, is that numbers get reported and collected in a variety of different ways. And so it's really hard to talk about the growth, the size and the growth of the B2C market. Uh, I think what is really pretty well accepted, though, is, is that it's, it's a pretty sizable, mar sizable market and that it continues to grow at a, a, at a fairly steady pace, a, pr a pretty aggressive rate. As far as what sells well on the internet, that really kind of depends. It's something that has changed over time. Currently, uh, there's a whole variety of different uh, categories that sell well, but originally when the, when the internet really started to get going and, and e-tailing really first started to get going, uh, first generation e-commerce, if you will, uh, simple items were really the, the items that sold best. So things like books and software and, and music. Uh, things that were rel relatively small, high value to weight ratio, things of that nature. However, as technology has kind of improved and our faith and, and uh, uh, in the, the ability of e-commerce to, to uh, e-commerce websites to convey information about goods and services across the internet have improved, that we kind of move beyond some of those simple transactions and, and kind of move to some of the more complex uh, type products. For example, furniture, expensive jewelry, designer clothes, appliances, even cars and, and flooring and, and big screen TVs. So the types of products have kind of evolved over time. Traditional retailing and e-tailing really aren't all that different. In fact, they share probably more similarities than they do differences. Having said that, there obviously are some differences between the two, two approaches. Um, probably nothing really bigger than the fact that in the online environment, uh, you really need to have a solid distribution uh, network or logistics strategy to be able to handle the delivery of your goods and services. Uh, so another uh, issue is in an online environment, the e-tailing environment, you need to have an extremely flexible infrastructure. You need to be able to have uh, the ability to ramp up your your technology infrastructure to be able to handle uh, um, significant e increases in demand. As far as um, um, some of the other advantages or kind of general concepts about e-tailing, e-tailers can offer expanded customer services that really aren't offered by some of their traditional retailers. In other words, they have, have some advantages. For example, they have lower product costs, uh, which allows them uh, allows for increasing competitive advantage. Now, that's a good thing and that's a bad thing because that's an advantage that you have over retailers as an e-tailer. But that's also an advantage that other e-tailers have as well. So the competition becomes much, much more significant. 
you're able to reach more customers, many outside of your, your normal or traditional regions. In other words, your customers are no longer those that are just around you. The whole world is, is potentially your, your customer base. It's easy to change prices and, and catalogs quickly um, because everything's online. You don't have to mail a new catalog. Hopefully you have lower supply chain costs. That's not necessarily the case because it, literally everything is shipped and you're shipping onesies and twosies. You're shipping individual items to customers rather than shipping in bulk as a, as a, as a wholesaler might do to a retailer. You're able to provide customers with a wealth of information thus saving uh, customer service costs. In other words, instead of dealing with the customer on a one-to-one -one basis, you're able to publish all this information into your, into your website and customers are able to go and check out that information individually as they as they see fit. So you're not having to deal with those customers individually, rather they're coming in and consuming that information uh, on their own time. And there's a variety of other uh, advantages of detailing well as well uh, discussed in the book. And this exhibit from the book kind of gives you a general overall view of the supply chain of what it might look and the book basically takes the perspective or gives you the impression that you're in the center of this supply chain if you will that if you're the company that's there in the middle of the of the exhibit but to the right it's the traditional b2c um, transactions that occur business to consumer you're selling to uh, consumers b2b transactions occur back to the left in other words we had to to be able to sell to our customers we obtain goods and services from other businesses that are higher up the supply chain. Essentially this is kind of a generic business model if you will. A business model is a description of how an organization intends to generate revenue through its business operations. Maybe a little bit more specifically it includes an analysis of the organization's customers and from that a discussion is created on how, how that organization will achieve profitability and sustainability by delivering goods and services or, or some, some type of value to those customers. The next several slides talk about very specific e-tailing business models and in general you can kind of classify some of those different models um, by the distribution channels that they use. For example, direct marketing by mail order retailers that go online, direct marketing by manufacturers, pure play e-tailers, click and mortar retailers, and internet uh, or online malls if you will. Direct marketers or direct marketing can either be companies that have just recently got into the e-tailing business or they can come from the traditional mail order retailers that, that move their business to the online environment. Some examples include QVC, Sharper Image, and Land's End for example. Basically the idea is that marketing takes place without intermediaries between the manufacturers and the buyers. This gives uh, um, uh, firms with an established mature mail order business a little bit of an advantage in the sense that they've already got an existing payment structure, inventory management, and order fulfillment operations in place. Direct sales by manufacturers are an attempt to remove as many intermediaries as possible between the manufacturer and the consumer. The drive behind this this uh, particular business model is to be able to save the markups that those various intermediaries might might take or would take in those transactions that occur. Probably the best example of this is Dell and the book also within this section kind of introduces a new, uh, another concept that, that really is kind of an important concept and it really comes to us out of the field of logistics. It's the idea of the pull distribution channel in as opposed to the push distribution channel in which products are manufactured sold and sold downstream uh, and it's simply hoped that demand will be there to purchase those goods or services well those goods uh, the pull based model is really more along the lines of what Dell does Dell doesn't manufacture a lot of their computers up front they wait until they get an order and then they produce it so it's a pull based so the it, they wait until the demand is there before they pr actually produce a product and that that uh, gives them a few advantages it, it gives them improved customer satisfaction and better pricing it allows large cost savings and finished vehicle inventory carrying costs in other words they don't have to sit there and store finished goods uh, until they're sold virtually real-time market feedback a barrier to entry against foreign made 
uh, uh, goods and better cash flow to the manufacturers. Now virtual or pure play e-tailers are firms that sell directly to consumers over the internet without maintaining a physical sales channel. So again, Dell is a, is a, is a great example of that. Amazon is a great example of that. Virtual e-tailers have, have an advantage of low overhead costs, streamlined processes, but you know there's certain drawbacks as well. Um, for example, they oftentimes they don't have an established infrastructure for to be able to deliver their services or, or goods uh, like traditional retailers might. A click and mortar retailer is really kind of a hybrid. It's a combination of uh, brick and mortar stores as well as on, an online presence. Uh, so it's a combination of, of both a traditional retailer and an online transactional website as opposed to the brick and mortar retailers which is really what we typically think of uh, when we think of, of a retail stores so Sears, Walmart, Target, uh, Macy's were all examples of brick and mortar stores or brick and mortar retailers they have since over the last several years evolved into becoming more of click and mortar retailers Yet another e-tailing business model is retailing on, in online malls. And there's a couple of different approaches to, to this uh, uh, particular business model. There's referring directories and there's malls with shared resources. Referring directories are really just that, they're directories. It's a, it's a directory organized usually around some type of product type. Um, they may have catalog listings or banner ad, ads. And once you select the, the particular product that you're interested in, you're taken to the retailers or the e-tailers website where the transaction is actually conducted. A mall with shared services, however, is a little bit different. Uh, the mall with shared services is actually actually advertises the various goods and services provided by all the various participants in that mall, and the mall itself uh, um, provides the services of arranging for payment and, and taking the order and arranging for shipment. So it reduces some of the burden on the e-tailers. There are a variety of other B2C models that uh, are really kind of special categories of, of e-tailing or retailing. Uh, for example, there's this concept that these transactions have really taken on a social nature, if you will. There's the idea of online group buying where in a traditional retailing environment, you might have multiple people that come together in order to buy in bulk in order to receive a large discount. Well, certainly the online environment allows groups to come together much easier and in, in larger groups, thereby hopefully the idea is to receive an even larger discount. And so those are some th things that are, are popping up. Uh, it, it's relatively easy to, to quickly find enough people to enjoy the discount of large volume buying and or share the freight and other costs. Um, in some cases, we rely on others as well, it, this social um, aspect of, of shopping. We rely on the reviews of others to kind of rate uh, uh, service, to rate um, the, the products or the, uh, that we're receiving from a, from a particular e-tailer. Uh, so word of mouth becomes very important. There's also personalized event shopping. Uh, some people like to be invited to special sales. It's, it's, they kind of get a thrill. Uh, from it. Uh, I can't say that I'm one of those individuals. Uh, my stepdaughter probably would, would fit right into that uh, that description, but essentially the idea is that you receive an invitation via your, your favorite uh, uh, method, Twitter, or Facebook, or email, or however you, you choose, and uh, once you get that invitation, you, you're able to kind of go and enjoy some of the savings for that, that specialized event. Uh, there's also private shopping clubs. Uh, it works kind of like Sam's, if you will, uh, or Costco, some of these, these discount places where you have to purchase a membership in order to be able to shop at those establishments. The online versions are, are referred to as private shopping clubs, a members-only shopping club where members can buy goods at large discounts. Still other little niches in the e-tailing business models area include group gifting online. It's it basically sites that allow different individuals to come together as a group in order to make make a purchase for for an individual for, for a particular event or for a particular occasion. Think of this as kind of like where you've got a, a group of people that normally would 
uh, during a birthday or something of that nature, kind of pool their money together in order to buy a bigger gift for, for an individual. Group gifting online kind of helps to facilitate that process. There's also location-based e-commerce. Imagine walking down the street and passing a Starbucks and all of a sudden you get a coupon for a dollar off your you know, venti coffee. Uh, it, it's something that's based on your location and, and retrieves information from your, your phone to determine where you are and, and the various r retailers that are around you and allows you to target ads to, to customers in that, in that sense or in that way. There's also the concept of shopping in virtual worlds. Uh, for example, Dell has uh, has a place in Second Life referred to as Dell Island. It allows you to, to log in to Second Life and travel around and, and enter various uh, e-tailer sites or e-tailer stores in this virtual environment and examine their various products and, and, and talk to individuals in this virtual environment and uh, essentially kind of test drive some of these, these products in that, that online environment. Um, that kind of leads us to the next bullet point there, virtual visual shopping. And it's this idea of being able to present these goods in a three, almost a 3D environment uh, um, in order to give us a little bit more realistic experience. Very early on in, in e-commerce, it was very hard or very challenging for sites to, to kind of even really approach the experience that you might have if you actually go to a retailer. Unfortunately for retailers, an awful lot of their, or, or for e-tailers I should say, an awful lot of the profit that retailers um, get is from impulse buys. Um, approximately 85% of all purchases are made at the shelf. So those impulse buys are very important. Well, at least conceptually, if we had the ability to market goods in a 3D environment, we would get much closer to that ability to, to improve impulse buy purchases. The travel and tourism services online is is made up predominantly by some very well-known companies. Obviously there's a lot of them out there. The companies such as Expedia, uh, Travelocity, Priceline, uh, just to name a few, and, and they all provide a lot of different services to a lot of different types of things, so car rentals, hotels, airlines, trains, etc. As far as some of the specific services that they offer, uh, they provide general information. Um, they help to reserve and purchase tickets and accommodations as well as entertainment. Oftentimes they provide travel tips and fare tracking, uh, detailed driving maps and directions, and in some cases chat rooms and bulletin boards that allow consumers to, to talk about their experiences, uh, both good and bad. Some special services that are provided by, by uh, uh, some of these groups in the, the uh, travel and tourism um, and hospitality services, if you will, they include wireless services, so the ability to, to log in and, and check various things and, and conduct advanced check-in. Uh, facilitates direct marketing, in other words, an airline oftentimes can send you, you know, once you've purchased a ticket, they can start direct marketing to you and offer you special deals on flights so they can directly market to you. Also facilitates alliances and, and consortia. In other words, you may have an airline that teams up together with a particular car rental company and they also participate with a particular hotel in order to kind of push you or steer you towards those those specific companies and they all benefit from that, that uh, alliance together. The concept of social travel networks are that that uh, many of these people get together online and share their experiences again, both good and bad. They go to Facebook and talk about their vacation and, and the fact that things went well in this particular location or that particular location, or that they traveled on this airline or that airline and it was a, a good experience or a bad experience. Um, and it helps to encourage business uh, or discourage business, if, depending on how, how things worked out. There are benefits and limitations to, to uh, um, online travel services. Some of the benefits include free information. Uh, it's just everywhere. You can find all kinds of information about your trips in terms of cost, in terms of experiences, uh, and things of that nature. Another advantage is that information is available all the time. I mean, online is, 24 /7, uh, is a 24-7 operation. 
you can also get a lot of substantial discounts uh, online if you got, especially if you have the time and, and patience to patience to really look for some of those deals. Uh, the benefits aren't just for consumers, though. Benefits are also for for some of the travel service providers, airlines, hotels, and cruise lines, for example, uh, are, are oftentimes able to sell what otherwise would be empty spaces. Uh, direct selling saves the providers commission and, and processing fees as well, but there are some limitations. Uh, the amount of time and the difficulty using virtual travel agencies can be significant, especially if it's a if it's a really complex uh, trip where you might have layovers and and things of that nature. Complex trips or, or those that require stopovers might not be available online because they require specialized knowledge and arrangements. So those are some of the the, the limitations of, of of those types of travel services. As far as corporate travel. Uh, using online optimization tools provided by travel companies, a lot of times companies can, can try to reduce some of their travel costs. E-commerce is also used for employment placement and the job market in, uh, in the online environment. As far as some of the participants who, who use the internet job market, obviously they're, they're the job seekers. There's also employers seeking employees, classified ads, job agencies, government agencies and institutions. When it comes to job seekers, we typically think of, of a few sites uh, which come to mind usually pretty quickly. CareerBuilder.com, CareerBuilder for example, Hot Jobs, uh, Monster.com. Uh, Another one that you may want to check out, especially if you're going to school full time and looking for a job after graduation, uh, you may want to check out CollegeRecruiter.com. As far as employers seeking employees, um, a lot of organizations or employers will want to advertise their openings on their own websites. But in other cases, um, they'll advertise their openings on popular public portals, uh, on some of those, those sites that we just got through talking about, um, online newspapers, bulletin boards, etc., et uh, recruiting pro uh, firms, etc. The idea is that from the employer's perspective, they're trying to automate as much of the hiring process as they can and so they can reach an awful lot of potential employees that way. A, relative, a relatively new trend that, that it, we're starting to see are the, the use of new tools uh, such as videos and, and meetups that uh, they can use to interview candidates from remote locations. Uh, I would recommend that you check uh, the, the uh, um, employment office um, um, I don't recall the specific name of it off the top of my head right now, but uh, there at Tarleton State, they actually offer the ability to, to create video resumes, uh, and it, it's something that you can certainly look into. Classified ads are another uh, um, um, thing to look into. Uh, examples include Craigslist, or eBay Classifieds, WebClassifieds.us. Uh, but don't forget about some of the social sites, social networking sites, such as, such as Facebook, where you might find some, some job openings uh, posted. Job agencies are also um, have online environments or, or, or uh, touch points, if you will. Hundreds of job agencies are active on the web. They'll use their own web pages to, to, to post available job descriptions and advertise their services. Uh, government agencies also, most government agencies advertise their their uh, openings for positions on their websites uh, and, and on other sites in some cases. In some cases they're required by law to do so, so be sure and check check those out. Online job markets on social networks. Uh, obviously the, the social network is, uh, is Facebook, but when we start talking about jobs, uh, there's some other ones out there that you might want to look at, at uh, look to as well. Jobster, for example, uh, blue chip expert, uh, and blue chip expert, I should say, um, and the idea is uh, is that they work to solve the problem of finding the right people for the job in, in a very short amount of time. They provide job seekers opportunities pr to promote their area of expertise, as well as to help them get found by their employers. Essentially, it operates as kind of a, a brokerage uh, for for headhunters to to go to and, and try to find candidates that have exactly the right skill set that they want. Uh, LinkedIn is probably another great example uh, of this type of, of uh, uh, site. Uh, global online portals for job placement. 
There's an interesting global site for placing or, or finding jobs in different countries called Zing.com. That's X-I-N-G.com. Uh, it's basically an electronic job market uh, um, that, again, allows you to do something very similar to, to match up your skills with potential jobs that are, are around the world. Something to keep in mind is this is kind of a two-way street. Not only does it help you to find jobs and, and get jobs and help employers to, to fill positions, but it also creates open positions. How does it do that? Well, basically the idea is if it's so easy to find jobs, well, what happens when there's a better job that comes open and you have the skills that match that job? You're much more likely to leave your current current position and, and, and go to that new position. Uh, so it, it does potentially create a higher turnover uh, for employees uh, by facilitating employees' movement to better jobs. Um, th that section also talks about the, the video uh, uh, online tools um, to, to interview candidates from remote locations. And then the last bullet point on this slide is virtual job fairs. Uh, basically a, a, a recruiting via social networks for quickly finding qualified candidates at reduced cost in really kind of a virtual environment that allows you to visit different uh, um, potential employers examine what their benefits are, their pay is, the, the job expectations, things of that nature. Uh, and it allows you to visit a lot more more uh, uh, potential businesses or, or hiring companies um, at a reduced cost. Some of the advantages of the electronic job market for job seekers and employers include things like um, it allows job seekers to find information on a large number of jobs worldwide. Uh, it allows the it creates the ability for job seekers to communicate quickly with potential employers. In other words, you can just fire off an email or potentially chat with uh, an employer online. You don't necessarily have to write a letter or drive down to their their organization to discuss the position. It allows you to market uh, yourself directly to potential employers. It allows you to write and post resumes for a large volume of uh, distribution. In other words, you can apply to a lot of people all at once. Uh, you can post a resume online at Career Builder, uh, for example, and headhunters or potential employees can all review that uh, very quickly. Uh, can search for jobs quickly from any location. Can obtain several support services at no cost. Uh, for example, Monster.com provides career planning services for free. Can assess the market value. In other words, get an idea of how much you, you're worth with your skills, your experience, etc. Uh, check out WageWeb and RileyGuide.org for, for salary surveys. Um, can learn how to use their voice effectively in an interview, GreatVoice.com for example. And can access news groups that are dedicated to finding jobs and, and hopefully keeping them. As far as employers' advantages, they can advertise to a large number of job seekers. In other words, they're not just necessarily advertising to the group that, that receives a particular newspaper, rather they're really advertising worldwide. They can save on advertising costs. They can reduce the application processing costs by using electronic application forms. In other words, they're not having to process paper, print paper, um, and then read the, uh, each form as it comes in. They can provide greater equal opportunity for job seekers. They can increase the chance of finding highly skilled employees. They can describe positions in, in great detail. In other words, they're not limited to just a few lines in a newspaper. They can add as much detail as they want in the online environment, uh, really subject only to, to the size of their hard drives. They can conduct interviews online using video teleconferencing. They can arrange for testing online. In other words, if they want to screen potential employers up front, they can have them take some type of an assessment online. They can also view salary surveys for recruiting strategies. In other words, what is the market paying? What are their competitors paying? So they'll have a better idea of what it's going to cost to get particular uh, recruits. E-tailing has also been significantly impacted by uh, several of the service industries which are really uh, um, becoming very popular on the internet. Uh, some of these include real estate, insurance, as well as stock trading online. For example, uh, uh, as it relates to real estate, the Burrell Associates forecast that uh, this year, 2013, that 33.1% of our projected $35.3 billion in re real estate-related advertising would be spent online. 
that's a lot of money. It's just advertising rentals on, uh, online. It's advertising a real estate sale online and you know, things of that nature. Uh, some of the sites where you might see some of this stuff, uh, Craigslist, Zillow, um, some of, as well as some of the other ones that are out there. Some of the services that they offer in, in, in some cases are free and they, they allow buyers to find information and do comparisons on their own essentially going through a disintermediation process of, of removing some of the middlemen, some of the traditional advertising mechanisms that have, that have used, uh, uh, been used by the real estate industry in the past. Insurance online is also a, a service that's becoming more popular. Uh, the sale of auto, home, life, and health insurance can oftentimes be done at a substantial savings to customers. Another one is online stock trading. Um, Companies such as E-Trade, uh, Schwab, uh, Scott Trade, all allow consumers to to relatively inexpensively uh, buy and sell stocks and, and bonds on, in an online environment quickly, easily, and usually at a, a, a at a pretty good uh, um, rate or, or cost to them relatively relatively speaking to some of the bigger uh, traditional brokerage houses. Um, Having said that, obviously there's risk whenever you're conducting financial transactions online. There is that risk of, of uh, you know, usernames and passwords and, and, and things of that nature. So that's something to be wary of. Nevertheless, it's, it's something that, that most consumers seem to have embraced and, and be relatively comfortable using. Related to that is banking and personal finance online. Electronic or online banking or e-banking, uh, it really just kind of refers to some of the various banking activities conducted from the home or, or on the road using an internet connection. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as cyber, ba cyber banking, virtual banking, online banking, and home banking. Some of the capabilities of home banking really provide uh, an incentive to, to use those services rather than the traditional banks. Uh, for example, there's a lot of information that you can get online. You can can uh, get general bank information, history, financial education, uh, employment information, interest rate quotes, etc. Um, you can also perform administrative uh, um, uh, functions as well. You can open an account, you can close accounts, you can order uh, uh, replacement checks, etc. You can also do uh, conduct transactions. You can pay bills. Uh, make deposits, uh, fund transfers, and, and so on. You can also utilize portal functions, uh, for example, links to, to financial information, links to community information, local businesses, etc. And then uh, sometimes there are some other services that are offered as well um, from online banking, uh, such as wireless capabilities and search functions. There's also a special class of, uh, of these banks that are referred to as virtual banks. And these are banks that really don't have any physical locations. And um, there's a good thing and a bad thing about this that obviously they're saving money by not having physical locations or not having to pay uh, for the real estate, uh, um, the, the safeguards of, of money in the vault, and, and things of that nature, per se. But uh, I, I, I would, the, the book gives, suggests a, a word of caution, if you will, uh, when it comes to virtual banks. Uh, of, a very large proportion of virtual banks uh, failed back in, in 2003 due to, a due to a lack of financial viability. Um, and then a number of other banks failed over the 2007 to 2010 period uh, as the economy hit a, a pretty rough uh, uh, spell in there. So it really seems like the more successful banks really tend to be more of the, the click and mortar type, those, those who have a physical presence as well as an online presence. There's also the international and multiple currency uh, banking uh, uh, side of things. Uh, e while some international retail purchasing can be done by using a credit card, in some instances you're going to have to use some other way to conduct transactions uh, when, when, um, when making purchases in an international environment. There's a couple of options, or there's several different options. Uh, Trade Card and MasterCard, for example, developed a multi currency system for global transactions. Bank of America and most other major banks offer international capital funds, cash management, trades and, ser trades and services, foreign exchange, risk management, 
uh, investments, merchant services, etc. So realize that when you're operating in an international environment and having to deal with multiple currencies, that there are some special situations that sometimes uh, require looking into in, into more in more detail. Implementation issues of online financial transactions include securing financial transactions, imaging systems, fees online versus fees for offline services, and risks. Securing financial transactions really is kind of a no-brainer. We talk about it a little bit more in Chapter 9 and Chapter 10, but it's pretty obvious that we need to make sure that that's a major issue when it comes to conducting transactions because we're dealing with, with money, we're dealing with account numbers and, th and personal information. So secure, uh, secure e-commerce uh, payment systems is a must. Uh, imaging systems is also another implementation issue. Users oftentimes expect images of incoming checks, invoices, and other related uh, uh, materials that they get and, and, and receive from their banks. Fees uh, online versus fees for, for offline services. Um, Computer-based banking services are often free by some banks, whereas other banks charge some type of a, a, of a fee. Uh, also, some banks charge for individual transactions. Financial institutions need to really think through, think this through in terms of their online costs versus their offline services costs. Uh, fees need to take into account the cost provided, uh, costs of providing the different types of services, the organization's desire to attract new customers, and the prices offered by competitors. In other words, if they're charging twice as much as all their competitors, it's going to be awfully hard for a financial institution to retain or attract customers. Many banks charge more for offline services in order to encourage customers to go online. As far as some of the risks, uh, some believe that, that virtual banks uh, have, have a liquidity risk. The, the idea that they, they simply don't have sufficient funds to pay obligations as they come due. Uh, and when you look at the failure rate of some of the banks in the past, uh, that, that may be a valid concern. Uh, so it, it's something to be wary of when you start talking about banks that operate in a purely virtual environment. Uh, hackers is obviously another uh, uh, concern that, that we tend to think about. We, we're concerned that individuals may, may hack into a bank system and, and move funds out of our accounts. So that's another risk that we have to, to be wary of. As far as online billing and, and bill paying, the popular, popularity of e-payment systems is, is growing substantially. The number of checks that the U.S. Federal Reserve System processes has been decreasing, while at the same time, commercial automated clearinghouse transactions has been increasing. So we tend to prefer those online payment uh, of monthly bills, such as our, our, our house payments, our, our rent, our car loans, our telephones, utilities, all that type of stuff. We prefer to automate that and, and rather than writing checks all the time. Um, kind of within the same category is the, the issue of taxes. And there's the issue of computation of taxes. Think about sales tax, for example. It depends on where you are in the country uh, as to if you're going to pay sales tax when you make a purchase online. And if so, where you pay that sales tax. Is it where the product was purchased from? Is it where the product is actually delivered to? Uh, so that becomes a bit of an issue uh, that has to be has to be considered. In 2008, grocery sales amounted to 7.3 billion dollars online. And it's expected to reach about 13.7 billion dollars, or 2% of total grocery sales from 2000 in 2012. So last year. Unfortunately, it's a very competitive market, and the margins are really very thin. Uh, most of the e-grocers are click and mortar retailers, such as Albertsons, um, or AmazonFresh.com uh, has a service as well. An e-grocer is a, a grocer that takes orders online and provides deliveries on a daily or, or other regular schedule, or within a very short period of time. And this kind of leads us into on-demand delivery service. Express delivery made fairly quickly after an online order is received obviously especially important when we're talking about perishable goods like you might see from a grocer. Um, this has been a very tough market uh, for, for e-tailers to operate in um, traditionally over the, uh, uh, over the last 10 years or so. It, they've typically been much more successful in metropolitan areas where the population is very large 
uh, and they're typically very close together. So you, you see these being fairly popular uh, on the coasts, uh, up in the, in the northeast around New York, uh, for example, um, uh, Manhattan, uh, as well as on the west coast in, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and things of that nature. Certain goods, such as software, music, or news stories, can be distributed in a physical environment, but they can also be dis uh, digitized and delivered over the internet. For example, you know, iTunes allows you to, to download movies, uh, 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 songs and movies. Netflix allows you to stream movies. The online entertainment industry is is uh, comes in many uh, different forms. For example, the traditional uh, entertainment industry includes things like television, film, radio, uh, music, games, reading, and, and gambling. All of these are now available online. You can get them get them across the internet. In some cases, there, the certain segments have actually grown in popularity because we're able to enhance the experience in the online environment. Uh, for example, online games offer multimedia experiences with all kinds of animation and, and sound. It really allows you to, to become more engaged in it. Adult entertainment is is uh, really been successful in even though it tends to be a, a, a segment that uh, a lot of classes or, or people uh, don't really like to talk about that much, it's really been able to be successful really because of three, three basic things. Um, one, it allows for a degree of anonymity uh, allows for instant gratification. You don't have to wait and go anywhere to, to view uh, online adult sites. Um, and the, the variety of choice. Uh, and, and those have really helped the online adult entertainment uh, industry to be successful. There's also internet gambling. Um, or I should say internet gaming, which in includes internet gambling. But it also includes arcade gaming, lotteries, uh, promotional incentives, and, and, and so on. Uh, the ease of access and use of broadband services throughout the world in recent years has really been vital to the expansion of online gaming, and it, it is something that is continuing to grow relatively rapidly, even though the economy has really been in a pretty tight spot over the last few years. Um, relative to offline gaming, online gaming has been growing at a rate greater than 10%. Online dating services are another thing that uh, um, can uh, be delivered online. And online dating is a dating system that allows people to make contact and communicate with each other over the internet. We have, we've all seen these commercials uh, online for Match.com and, and all those uh, other sites that, that are out there. Um, basically, they provide unmoderated matchmaking o over the internet. This, too, has been a very lucrative uh, um, area over the last several years. Uh, according to Juniper Research in 2007, online dating sites were projected to increase revenue from $900 million in 2007 to $1.9 billion in 2012. That's about a 16% increase each year over those five years. There's a lot of different sites and tools that are available out on the web to help consumers with their online purchasing decisions. Uh, sites that allow you to, to do price comparisons, uh, sites that allow you to evaluate services, uh, that, that you know evaluate individuals' trust of a, of a particular site, uh, the quality of a, of a good or service from various sites. So there's a lot of tools that are out there. Uh, some of them include shopping portals. A shopping portal is a gateway to a web store or an e-mall. Uh, one example of that is shopping.com. Another example is actually eBay, which most of us are familiar with. Um, it, it, it's could be described as a shopping portal because it also uh, also offers shopping at fixed prices in addition to those auction uh, the auctions that they offer. They're also helping communities. Helping communities are, are oftentimes social communities that help members uh, um, to find goods and services and evaluate the quality of them, etc. Another example. There's been several examples throughout the book, uh, but another example is Yub.com, which is an online mall where you can meet people from around the world. You can, can discuss products and trends and things of that nature, and you can shop at a variety of different online retailers. Uh, you can earn various discounts as a member of Yub.com, and you can earn, earn an additional discount by helping others to, to uh, make purchases uh, from Yub.com. 
Still other online purchasing decision aids include things like shopping robots. Uh, it, these are things that I, I personally enjoy. There's one called pricegrabber.com that uh, I think is a great site. It basically allows you to type in what you're looking for. And oftentimes if you have a, a brand and model number, you can find exactly what it is you're looking for. And it retrieves a, a list of that particular brand and model from a, a variety of different retailer shop, uh, reta uh, uh, e-tailing shops um, and gives you the comparison of the different prices, but also details uh, some of the features, product details, product reviews, um, sometimes reviews from the merchants as well as consumers, and a whole host of other information that are available on that particular good. There's also Google Commerce Search, um, which is kind of the next iteration of Google's uh, search feature or shopping feature. Uh, it, it's a, 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 a powerful search service for online stores. It helps online retailers maximize their sales satisfaction and usability by allowing customers to find exactly what it is that they're looking for, basically without having to go to these other, uh, uh, these other sites, Price Grabber, for example. Uh, for e-tail retailers or e-tailers, it's an innovative merchandising dashboard, or provides an innovative uh, merchandising dashboard. Uh, it's basically simple, uh, a simple way to manage and target uh, uh, customers with, with promotions and things of that nature. There's also spy services, which are, are basically robots that are working for you as an individual um, without you being tethered to your computer. Uh, it, it's something that allows you to monitor, for example, stock prices and send you an email when a price hits a certain level. Uh, same thing on an eBay uh, bid. Maybe you're bidding on something and you want to make sure you bid, uh, uh, that you win that particular item. Spy services allow you to be notified when a, a bid that exceeds yours comes in so that you can log back in and, and uh, up your bid to, to the winning bid. And then there's the wireless shopping comparisons that the book talks about. Don't be confused, it seems kind of vague in the book about this. Really all they're talking about is the availability of smartphones to be able to have access to the internet virtually everywhere we go. It allows us to do comparison shopping all the time. We're able to log in when we're at, the, the, at a store. We can log into a, a, a various competitors' websites, check prices online while we're standing in front of a product and to make the determination, is this a good buy or is it not a good buy? Still other online purchasing decision aids include things like uh, uh, business rating sites. Uh, a lot of websites rate various e-tailers um, and their online products based on a variety of different criteria. Some examples of these, these, these businesses that do this are, are sites like bizrate.com, Consumer Reports Online, uh, as well as Forrester Research. In many cases though, we really like to get recommendations from other shoppers, friends, things of that nature. And that's really kind of led to a, what's ref, sometimes referred to as a referral economy. It's the effect of consumers receiving a referral or recommendation from other consumers on their buying actions. Uh, Caboodle offers uh, uh, places for, for consumers to be able to exchange these types of things. You also see it on, on a lot of e-tailers' websites. Uh, go to Amazon, for example. A lot of times you will see um, um, recommendations from other uh, purchasers of that same particular good. In some cases, we don't really know who to turn to. We don't know, you know what site uh, uh, to really trust uh, and whether or not it, they're trustworthy in terms of making a recommendation or not. And so in some cases, we can turn to what are sometimes referred to as trust verification sites. And there's several different ones of these. There's Trustee, there's VeriSign, there's the Better Business Bureau online. And these are basically sites that hopefully uh, the vast majority of consumers trust uh, and have faith in and can turn to for reliable information. There's also other online shopping tools, uh, uh, other digital intermediaries, if you will, that help buyers and sellers, or in some cases both, with research and, and, and purchase processes. For example, there's escrow services, which exist, and it's very similar to what you see in the, 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 the real estate world, where you have somebody that wants to purchase a home. You don't necessarily know the seller of the home, so rather than simply give them money up front as you're going through the process of, of making the purchase, you put money in escrow, and that's essentially giving the money to a third party for them to hold on to as the process goes forward before you actually finalize the rest of the deal. It works the same way in the online environment. It's a trusted third party that takes acceptance of the, 
of the money, takes acceptance of the good, verifies that the, the, the proper amount of money is there, that the good is what it was advertised, and then does the exchange. Uh, and, and it's a way just to assist both sides, both parties. Uh, another online shopping tool, uh, Yelp, for, is an example. It's a search engine whose mission really is to help people find local uh, uh, goods and services, um, restaurants and uh, mechanic services, you know, automobile services, and things of that nature. Moving to an e-environment e has not been as easy as, as some would have liked and as easy as uh, everyone might think. The reality is, is there have been some growing pains to, to move to the online environment. The initial promise was this concept of disintermediation, which we've talked about before. It's the removal of organizations or business processes, uh, process layers responsible for certain intermediary steps in a given supply chain. So it's that wholesaler in the middle that we get rid of, or the retailer, or both. So we go straight from the manufacturer to the, to the, the consumer. The advantage of disintermediation is they're no longer taking their, their markups, so presumably we'll have a reduced price, reduced cost. The reality is, is that sometimes intermediaries, though, are providing actual value. They're providing some service that's worth more than what their markup is. And that leads to a process referred to as re-intermediation, the process whereby intermediaries, either new ones or those that had been disintermediated, take on new intermediary roles. So they re-enter into the process. And this exhibit tries to illustrate that, the, the, the basic, simple, traditional supply chain that you might see where you have a supplier that sells to a producer, that sells to a distributor, that sells to a retailer, that ultimately sells to the end consumer. And with the process of disintermediation, perhaps you eliminate the, the, um, the retailer altogether uh, and perhaps the distributor uh, even. And so the supplier sells to the producer who may sell directly to the end consumer, or the supplier sells to the producer who sells to the distributor who then sells to the end, end consumer. So again, the idea is that they, the markup that the retailer is taking or that the distributor is taking is more than the value that they're providing to the supply chain. If, however, one of those uh, uh, intermediaries is actually providing more value than the, the markup that they were taking, then what will happen is they may be reintroduced into that, that supply chain. And that's what the, the last part, part C down there, is trying to illustrate. Now when we say they're producing more value than, than the markup that they're taking, what types of value might they be providing? Well, it may be information that they're providing about the good or the service that's being provided. It may be about support after the sale or support before the sale. So there's a variety of different ways for intermediaries to provide services um, to justify their markup. Uh, it just really depends on how much they're taking. If they take too much, uh, too much markup for relative to the value that they provide, they're prime targets for disintermediation. Another lesson learned was the idea of channel conflict, the situation in which an online marketing channel upsets the traditional uh, channels due to real or perceived damage from competition. There was an example of this several years ago um, with in the apparel industry, I believe it was Levi's, um, who began to market, uh, uh, market jeans online directly to consumers. And that channel essentially upset the traditional channel of selling through retailers because they were able to undercut their price. Levi then had to make a choice uh, about how they were going to go, go forward in terms of utilizing some of the benefits of, of, of the online environment while at the same time not uh, um, upsetting their traditional channels that they had. They ended up ultimately moving to the point of providing lots of information services online and, and pushing customers to their uh, um, uh, traditional retailer or retail outlets uh, at the expense of selling directly. Um, but it is an issue that retailers have to be very cognizant of, that when they sell in multiple channels, they have to be very careful about how they go about doing that and the types of services that they offer at both. 
for click and mortar stores, there's also the possibility of a price conflict. Uh, it's very difficult for um, click and mortar stores to find, it, it's, it's a tricky situation for them to find a good pricing strategy because they have to have prices that are competitive both in the online environment as well as the, the store environment, the physical store environment and it becomes difficult for those prices to be very close to each other um, so it, it's, it sometimes becomes a hurdle that they have to overcome. There's also the issue of product and service customization and personalization and this is probably a good problem to have. Um, the online environment really facilitates the the customization uh, uh, services that are, are available to users. In other words, they can, can build and design and build their own computer to get exactly what they want. Uh, they can order furniture that's exactly the, the, the material that they want and things of that nature. So it allows you to provide services that are very customizable to to uh, um, consumers in ways that they really weren't able to do in the tradi traditional uh, environment easily. Um, there's also online custom or online competition. Uh, everybody has a website. Everybody is online. So you're competing. Are you able to compete easily with the big boys? Yes, you are. It's very easy for you to throw up a website and and try to compete with very large retailers. But you're not the only one with that opportunity. So are the other seven billion people on the planet. And then there's also the issue of fraud and other illegal activities. Fraud, especially in the B2C market, is increasing uh, rapidly, and, and it causes losses not just to buyers but also to sellers. And lastly, e-tailers really need to learn to speak with one voice. In other words, tie their systems together in such a way so that they're providing a consistent user experience throughout the, the process, whether they're talking about click and mortar uh, uh, aspects of their uh, 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 the brick and mortar aspects of their organization or the online aspects of their organization. Make sure that things look the same, terminology is the same, the user experience is the same. So speak with that one voice by tying all your systems in together. Leverage the multi-channel uh, uh, multi channel richness. In other words, the idea is that just because we operate in an online environment and we operate in a face-to-face -face environment doesn't mean that they're operated as two separate entities. In other words, we may purchase something online, but we want to return it to the physical store. We need to facilitate that and make that easy for customers to be able to do. And we want to empower the customer. We want to make it easy for the customer to be able to, to do things themselves. In other words, place orders themselves online without having to, to necessarily contact a customer service representative. They should be able to check the inventory online. Uh, to make sure that whatever it is that they're looking for is available. They should be able to find local uh, store information in terms of location and, and hours, product information, things like that. So what are some of the, the managerial issues or the concerns that managers need to have when they're thinking about going into the e-tailing business or they're taking over an e-tailing business that already exists? Uh, what are some of those managerial issues? Well. We have to understand that there are limitations to e-tailing, and we have to also kind of keep in mind where e-tailing is going. Why? It's a dynamic environment. It, where it is right now, it's not going to be that way in five years, ten years, fifteen years, etc. How should we introduce wireless shopping? That's something else. We that's that's where e-tailing e is going right now. Um, so we need to to think about how we're going to move our organizations into that environment. Do we have ethical and privacy guidelines in place? You know, if we're collecting all this data, how are we going to safeguard that? Uh, what are we going to do with it? Things of that nature. How will intermediaries act in cyberspace? That's another concern. If, if we're afraid uh, in, in our particular supply chain that intermediaries have too much power, they might start to gouge us on price, and we need to be aware of that, and we need to think of, of ways to perhaps disintermediate them. Should we try to capitalize on social networks? Certainly a lot of businesses are moving into that environment. They try to take, take advantage of, of Facebook and Twitter and things of that nature to be able to capture market share, to get the attention of, of potential customers uh, and, and people like that. How should we manage multi-channel marketing to avoid channel and or price conflicts? Uh, this is a complicated 
um, a, a complicated problem that that uh, large click and mortar stores have, uh, especially uh, brick and mortar stores that are trying to move into the online environment. What are the major potential limitations of the growth growth of B2C e-commerce? Uh, those are other managerial issues that we have to consider. So in this chapter we talked about the scope and characteristics of e-tailing. We talked about the different classifications of e-tailing business models. We talked about how the online travel and tourism service operates. We talked about the online job market and, and some of the benefits that it has to not just us as job seekers but also to, to employers. We talked about the electronic real estate marketplace and, and how uh, e-commerce has, has really uh, changed things up a bit there. We talked about online trading and stocks, uh, 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 online trading of stocks and bonds. We talked about cyber banking and personal finance and the need to really be kind of wary of some of those purely online banks. Um, but the idea is, is we like uh, we, we like doing automated payments and things like that rather than writing traditional checks. We talked about on-demand delivery service, uh, things like uh, um, groceries and, and, and things like that, that they work really well in population areas where the population is very dense, uh, New York City, for example. We talked about the delivery of digital products. It works very well with certain types of things, ebooks, for example, music, movies, I think Netflix and, 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 and things like that. We talked about aiding consumer purchase decisions with a variety of different tools that are available to us. We have shopping agents, for example, shopping uh, robots that allow us to e easily compare uh, um, uh, the prices of, of goods from various retailers. And then we finished up talking about disintermediation and other B2C uh, strategic issues. That's the end of this chapter. Take care.